The planet's puppet masters almost surely have a plan This clearly may be something near beyond the realm of man And until you've thoroughly tested every last close just That's true, Dr. Zayas. Very well. Where would we be without THC? Cause we know they're lying to us, just don't know to what degree. Yeah, where would we be without THC? The highest side chat show, Greg Carl Wood Company. All right, higher side chatters, life is a strange and mysterious thing that the collective brain power of the planet's people, past and present, really haven't gotten that far into figuring out. Is it a consciousness-controlled romp through the material plane for the sake of smelling roses and eating chocolate? Is it a virus unpacking itself and evolving until it can build its own gods? Or is it some cosmic school for self-development where we swim up the spiritual river like salmon destined to spawn? Folks, we have no idea. But what we do know is that we spend about a third of our whole earthly experience in sleep mode. Unconscious, unaware, and ultimately unleashed into a different experience altogether, the dream time. And while we must sleep and dream to live, we dedicate little time to understanding what might be the weirdest aspect of life when you get down to it. Are dreams really just screensavers for active minds while the body recharges? Or should we be pulling out powerful meaning from the symbols and the messages delivered by a subconscious yearning to be acknowledged? Most of us have probably had times where a dream felt like more than just a dream, and with us to sort out this mess and better understand the signs and symbols of the dream state is the great decoder himself, J.M. DeBoard. J.M. is the author of Dreams 123, Remember, Interpret, and Live Your Dreams, and more recently, The Heavy Tome That Found Its Way to Higher Side Studios, the Dream Interpretation Dictionary, Signs, Symbols, and Meanings, nearly 450 pages of alphabetically organized aspects that many people encounter in their dreams, from aliens to zombies and everything in between. He's also a frequent partaker in the sacrament we call Reddit, where he is known as Rad Owl, the Reddit Dream Expert, a respectable title if I do say so myself, and I can't wait to get down to it. J.M. DeBoard, welcome to the higher side. Oh, Greg, it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. Thanks for being here. I did have a lot of fun with the Dream Interpretation Dictionary. I think a lot of people feel like there is some meaning in what they dream, but very little in our waking life really provides us with the skills to decode them unless we really dedicate some effort on our own. And so I'm curious how this kind of became your thing. Obviously, others have tried to wear the crown, but what got you into dream interpretation and what makes your approach different or maybe even more accurate than what's already out there? Well, you know, in your introduction, you talk about how we are looking. We know that life is more than just this biological matter that is spinning through space. And, you know, that there is something more to all of this and that our dreams seem to provide a portal to it, except Dreams can appear to be very disconnected from your everyday reality. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a, a dream about being back in high school, but that was 20 years ago when you graduated and you're standing there and, you know, it's this teacher you don't know and your pants are down around your ankles <laughs> and people are laughing at you and you're going, wait, wait, I'm not in high school anymore. Why would I dream about this? Well, if you break it down, there's some kind of meaning behind it. So I started off, I really was... I've always been interested in exploring the mind, especially the parts of it that we're not very aware of. You might call it the subconscious or the unconscious. You know, most of our mind is beyond our awareness. 95 to 99% of the mind is unconscious. So that means this little tip of the iceberg that we know of our, as our conscious mind, as our ego, or as ourselves, is just this very small part of the big picture. So, of course, I've always been interested in anything that can tell me more about how we tick and how we really work inside of ourselves. But, Greg, there's another part of it, which was when I was in my mid 20s. I was looking for answers. It was sort of the classic situation where I, you know, I'm hitting a wall in my life and I'm looking and I'm not finding what I'm looking for. You know, and in a very synchronous experience, a neighbor friend of mine showed me chapters from a book printed off of a computer. This is back in the mid 90s. So you couldn't just like, you know, hop on the Amazon and grab your favorite book. Right. Hmm. So I found this 
guy, this writer, his name is Larry Pesavento, and I was reading the chapters of his book that he was passing around among friends. And he referred to dreams, and he referred to a guy named Dr. Carl Jung, the Swiss psychiatrist. And anyone mm. who delves into the mystic and the unknown is going to run across Carl Jung at some point because he is our captain. He is the one who explored those depths. And I caught on to Jung, and it was just like something lit a fire in my mind. I found somebody who could take these things that were batting around in my head that were related to the psyche and spirituality and religion and God and experience and soul and all of that and put it into the language of psychiatry. And it just resonated with me very deeply. So I started a very deep exploration and I found in through my dreams that I was gaining the answers and the insights that I needed. And then I started going public with it first if we're among friends and stuff, but just sort of helping them with their dreams. I met my wife, Lisa, and she was in a transition in her life about 10 years ago, and I helped her understand the dreams that she was having and how they were connecting with her life. And I went, wow, you know, I think I really am onto something here. So then I dropped by Reddit. Yes, our our friend Reddit, where, you know, we explore many different subjects and there is a dreams forum there. And I just started talking to people about their dreams. I wasn't presenting myself as an expert or as an interpreter just somebody who had really delved into the subject and had a real deep personal interest and fascination with it. So from there, I got great feedback from people and I decided I needed to bottle the magic. Mm -hmm. So I wrote Dreams 1, 2, 3, and that opened up the door into the publishing industry, which had been closed to me. I had tried. I worked in journalism and I worked in various media, television and radio. And I had tried to find an agent. I wrote a novel. I had these great ideas about being an author and, you know, writing books that really change people's lives and open their minds and all this. But boy, those doors were closed. And when I came to my agent with the idea for a book about dreams, she wasn't even my agent at the time. She read my proposal in two weeks. I kid you not. After two weeks after she signed me, I had my publishing contract. So it's really, it's been a, a heck of a journey since then. I have gone really deep with this subject and I find that I have a way of explaining it to people that strips out the jargon and, and some of the academic talk. And it really puts it in terms of understanding your dreams as stories about yourself and your life with the purpose of helping you to learn and grow. That is the bottom line right there. And if you start there, then everything builds on top of that into this structure in your mind that can help you to analyze and understand your dreams. So that kind of makes a short story long, Greg, but that's how I got in the dream interpretation. Boom. <laughs> I love it. Can't argue with that. It is nice when you find your wheelhouse, isn't it? So if we wanted to maybe lay a nice base in regards to sleep and dreaming from a scientific perspective, what can you tell us? What do you think is really happening there? Why do we do it? Well, the first thing to understand, and I go over this in my book, The Dream Interpretation Dictionary, is you need to understand the reasons why you dream. There are biological, there are mental, there are physical reasons, there are spiritual reasons, emotional reasons. And the bottom line, really, which is agreed upon from all the different disciplines that have looked at dreaming, is that you dream to process and collate your memories. You're taking the experiences that you've had since the last time that you slept and you're processing them more deeply into your being, into your psyche. So all of those memories are there. They're stored in short-term memory. And when you go to sleep and you dream, your mind is figuring out where this new experience, these new memories, where does it fit into who and what you are? So that's first. The second thing that they do is they help to get into your emotions. They delve down in there. They trigger emotions. They remind you of what you felt. They help you to more deeply process those emotions. In some ways, what dreams are doing is just clearing out the memory banks and the emotional storage banks. They are helping you to recharge. You have to get some of that released out of you so that you can wake up the next day and go, okay, I'm ready to take on the world again. I mean, imagine if you woke up and you felt the same way as when you went to sleep. Imagine if all of the emotion and feeling and thoughts and everything else was still there and you just continue adding on to it. And then the next day you wake up and you add on to that. 
there would get to a point where I think that most people would not be able to handle it anymore. It would just be head explode. You know, there's too much. So your dreams are really helping you to process this day-to-day -day activity and helping you, A, to release it, and B, to figure out how it fits into you, to sort it and collate it, sort of like what a computer does when it's, it processes information more deeply into its circuitry and its chips and its hard drive and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Then there's a deeper layer. Call it the spirit layer. <laughs> there is this thing inside of you that is wanting to have more meaning and satisfaction and fulfillment from your life. And it often gets overlooked or neglected. Sometimes we're just too busy to pay much attention to this side of ourselves that is trying to find expression. It wants to live, you know, to be or not to be. That is the question. It's, you know, how much life are you going to grab out of this experience? How much are you going to engage and dive down into this experience? Dreams are your facilitator for that. They help you to understand what's really going on underneath the surface. They help to bring things forward so that you don't overlook them. They want you to connect very deeply inside of yourself and also with the world and the people who are in it. So your dreams are helping you on a nightly basis or whenever you sleep. It could be a daily basis. They're helping you. They're trying to get you to learn and to grow, to engage with your life, to find more meaning and fulfillment and satisfaction from it. It can go deeper than that, Greg, and I'm sure that in the rest of our talk here that we'll delve into some of the, the psychic side of dreams, dreams about finding soulmates and the love of your life and dreams about being abducted by aliens, and we'll get into the symbolism and all that. But for now, I think the bottom line is you dream to learn and to grow. It helps you to be able to handle your daily life better, and it helps you to find that deep person that's inside of yourself. Mm. Yeah, man, I think that makes a lot of sense. And kind of like you said, I think dreaming to me is like a baked in mechanism to entice us to further explore the mysteries of life and consciousness, because the authoritarian system, you know, it can reduce us down to joyless worker drones who are overly obsessed with artificial distractions like debt and sports. They can leave meditation and spiritual development out of our entire education and try to ban entheogenic exploration. But from slaves right on up to kings, you can bet that they're going to be going into a trance state when the sun doesn't shine. And that is a hell of a thing to take for granted, really. Boy, you know, it's kind of like everybody dreams and everybody pays taxes. Well, you know, most everybody does. And, you know, <laughs> there are a few things. Basically, the point is, is there are a few things in life that are common to all of us. I find as a moderator at Reddit, you know, I'm reading sometimes as many as a couple of dozen dream reports per day. That's the, the good days when I really have time to devote there. And I get a very good feel for what people are dreaming right now and why. And you mentioned that feeling of sort of just being a worker drone who's going through life without finding anything deeper to it. Mm hmm. And in my experience as a moderator, as a dream interpreter, and just as a dreamer, I find that dreams are really focusing in on that aspect of life. They want you to find something deeper for yourself. Hmm. If you need to disconnect from the rat race, your dreams will show you how to do it. It may not be able to happen immediately, but they will guide you towards finding that thing in your life that's going to help you to get more out of it. And if that means no longer being a worker drone, that's fine. You know, some people are happy with that. Their work is only to get a paycheck and benefits so that they can raise a family or whatever it is that they want to do outside of work. So they don't always have to have work that's the most creative or the most fulfilling. It's just, you know, steady and dependable is really what they're looking for. But if you do want more from life, if you do want to be a more creative person, if you want to be a more spiritual person, your dreams will be glad to guide you in that endeavor. The unconscious mind is always in the background reviewing what you as an ego or conscious mind, what you are doing, what you are thinking, what your desires are, what your goals and ambitions are. So when you hit upon something that the unconscious mind agrees with, when you make a decision that you're going to do something like, let's say 
you decide I'm going to make time to meditate because I want to find that deep inner center of my being. I want to find that calm and that peace. Well, that is something that your unconscious mind can really agree with. You know, it can say, okay, I'm going to facilitate this. I'm going to help you with that goal. Together, we are going to march forward towards this. And when you have both sides of the mind working together, you can really get to that goal. I listened to your interview with Bruce Lipton, and he mm. talks about this too, that you can decide something consciously. You can say that you believe something. You can have the power of positive thinking or whatever. But if it's not resonating with the other side of your mind, if the two sides of your mind are not in agreement, well, now they're going to pull in different directions. And it's just going to become this big energy vacuum. It's going to suck it into that black hole. And you're not going to get to that place where you're trying to get to. When the two sides of the mind agree, and dreams are a great way of helping you to hash these things out between the two sides of the mind and come to agreement. Well, when that happens, you are able to more easily manifest the things in your life that you can imagine for yourself and that you desire and that your heart wants. Mm, those are great points. And, you know, dreams can be so surreal. And obviously, not all dreams are created equal. How can we determine if and where there is meaning and, you know, which types of dreams or symbols to prioritize when we're trying to look for that meaning? Great question. I get asked this a lot. And so I want to delve into this because your audience needs to know, your listeners, they need to know the answer to this question because, you know, you can dream in REM stage sleep for up to 25% of the time while you are asleep. That means 25% of the time you are in a stage of sleep that involves intense and vivid dreaming. If you sleep for eight hours, that's two hours of dream material that you can potentially wake up with, and it's all going to be calling out to you to do something with it. Well, mm -hmm. fortunately, a lot of that processing happens subconsciously, and you already know the meaning of your dreams because they are invented deep in your mind. It's just, it's a part of your mind that most people are kind of disconnected from, so it seems like their dreams kind of come out of nowhere and that they are meaningless. A lot of people come away with this. Studies have shown that more than half of people wake up with little to no memory of their dreams. And I haven't seen the latest numbers, but I can tell you that around the same amount of the population thinks that dreams are meaningless. It's just brain farts. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just this biological process that's going on that's producing imagery and the brain is taking that imagery and trying to weave it together into some kind of meaning because the brain has a proclivity for trying to find meaning and pattern in everything. Well, here's the secret sauce for you, Greg. Some dreams are meaningless. They are just the warm up. They are your mind that starts producing imagery. And oftentimes it's very basic sort of patterned imagery or memories from the day. Like, let's say that you're a trucker. You spend all day on the highway. You get to your hotel or to your home. You plop down in your bed. You start to dream and dream in the sense of there's just imagery behind your eyes. You're going to dream about the highway. You know, you're going to dream about what you were doing during the day. It's just going to be sort of a review of this, but without even a meaningfulness to it. It's just more like, let's clear out these short-term memory banks. We're going to just spit all this stuff out and your dreams will provide a view into what is basically a neurological or mental process. Now, as the night goes on, and your body first gets the rest that it needs, your REM stages will grow longer. First, you have these long stages of deep sleep. It's just deep, dead sleep. You might have some imagery behind your eyes, but it's not going to be meaningful. When it gets meaningful is when that imagery forms into stories. Bottom line, right there, boom, stories. And when the stories engage you, when they get interesting and in your mind and your feelings, that when it engages with these stories, that's when you know that you're getting to the meaningful content. The symbols in the dreams, the dreams take your memories, they turn them into symbols, and then the symbols turn into stories. When the stories get really interesting, that is when you engage the most with them. And then when you engage the most with them, those tend to be the dreams that are also the most memorable. So you wake up in the morning and what you were left with, if you were like most people who spend at least a little bit of time with your dreams, 
you can remember maybe five to 10 minutes of content. That five to 10 minutes is the most important information that you need to draw out of dreamland and pull into your waking life and do some deeper thinking on it. Sometimes it doesn't even necessarily have to be analyzed. Just look at the dream as a story. That's what it is. We can all analyze stories. You don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to wear the guru robes. Anyone can understand a story. Every day of our lives, we are taking in stories. And every day we are creating stories, especially the narratives of our lives. We take our lives and we turn it into a narrative. A narrative is a story. So when that happens, you have this base of knowledge inside of you about how stories work, and that knowledge can be used to tell you how dreams work. So the most meaningful dreams are the ones that stand out. They're the most memorable, and they're the most story-like, and they're the most engaging to you. You can pull out five or 10 minutes of the most meaningful content and really focus on that. The rest of it, well, you know... If there's something that's important there and you either don't remember it or you're unable to understand or analyze it, it'll come back. This is one of the things that I teach in my workshops and my lectures. A lot of people who come to them are new to dream work and they ask me, what should I focus on? And I say, the recurring themes and imagery from your dreams. We all have recurring dreams. There are different types of them. And I explain the difference in my book. But you have. The recurring dreams are what I call the lowest hanging fruit on the tree. It's the easiest to reach out and grab hold of and pull close to yourself and then to analyze it and understand it. I'll give you a quick example. I have recurring dreams about working in a restaurant as a waiter. I did this for years in you know, the younger part of my life, and I haven't done it in years, but I still dream about it on a almost nightly basis. There will be some dream in there where I am in a restaurant. And most of the time of those dreams that stand out to me are the ones where I am, I look out at my station, a waiter station is all the tables that you're responsible for. And I've gone from no one to packed. This is the waiter's nightmare, by the way, is that suddenly having too much to do. You want to have like a nice flow of work coming to you so that you can handle it all and you can, you know, give everybody the experience they're looking for and you make good tips off of it, right? It's when you get overwhelmed is when everything starts to fall apart and when you start having that very heavy stress from the job. In my dreams, this is what happens over and over again. I go from zero to a thousand miles an hour in a heartbeat and I'm going, how am I going to do all of this? Well, this is what I figured out from analyzing these dreams is is that the theme connects in with the idea of having too much to do. In my waking life, I have too much to do. I have too much that's competing for my attention. That is what all of those people who are in my dream and they're sitting at tables and they're reading menus and they're waiting for me to come along and take their order and deliver their drinks and their food and all that. That's what they symbolize. They symbolize the things in my life that need my attention. It can be people in my life that need my attention, but it can also just be the things that are on my to-do list. So now when I have a recurring dream like that, when that pops up, I know to look at my daily life and go, okay, I either need to really buckle down and get things knocked off of my to-do list, or I need to simplify. I need to get a few of those things off of my list and just realize, hey, maybe my ambitions are larger than my ability to be able to achieve all of them. That's okay to pare down that list somehow. So look at your recurring dreams. Start there. They are the most important themes and the stories that pop up in your dreams. You're going to find them there. If you start with your recurring dreams and you can start to understand some of the imagery and the symbolism, you can use it as your answer key. So now when you have another dream that is about the same subject or brings up the same sort of story theme, you can wake up and you immediately have some of the groundwork laid. You know, you wake up and you go, okay, I understand this part of the dream. What does the rest of it mean? And when you have that answer key from figuring out the certain parts that recur in dreams, now you can go to the rest of the dream and figure it out more easily. Right on. Yeah, that's great advice for getting started. And to dive a little deeper into that, 
So if dreaming is some form of symbolic communication with our subconscious, to get better at receiving the message, it's sort of like we have to get familiar with the language. Of course, most languages have a structure or a set of rules, various ways to emphasize certain things over others. Is there a reliable, universal structure to the way that the subconscious communicates, like highlighting things in certain colors or forms or just certain forms of emphasis, anything else like that? You know, a great way to think about dreams is they do use a language and the language is symbolism. So that is really the place to begin. And decoding symbolism is one of the first things that I teach about dream interpretation. Now, from that, and we can launch more into how to decode symbolism. We can do that a little bit later. Now, you ask if there is a way that dreams have a structure to them. Is there a universal way that they create their stories? And I won't say universal, but I have noticed a pattern. And as somebody with a journalism background, I know the structure of the way that you're supposed to present most stories. It's the inverted pyramid structure. And I have recognized that dreams use sort of a structure like that. It's a, call it a template, and that many dreams will follow that template. And here it is. It starts off by giving the subject of the dream. When somebody gives me a description of a dream, I often find the subject in the first sentence or two. And then what it's going to do is it's going to review the past. It's going to talk about the present and it's going to point towards the future. So if let's say that this is a dream is addressing an issue in your life and it started when your parents divorced and you were a teenager and something happened to you, it caused a rift inside of you. It might have been many, many years ago, but that rift is not healed. Let's just use this as an example. So now the dream puts you in your family home where you used to live where the divorce happened. And it somehow in the first scene is going to say that this dream is about what happened back then. And then it's going to show you where you are in the present of your life. If there is something that is unhealed, it might show a way it'll speak in symbolism. It might show it as a wound on your body. It might project out that wound onto someone else, like let's say a sibling who was there who also experienced the divorce. Now you're looking out and you're seeing your sibling and your sibling is wounded or covered in blood. Well, that could make people really distressed, but it is a language of symbolism and the blood or the wound represents the emotional the psychological wound of the experience of the family divorce. It puts you in a setting of the old family home to refer to the past. It says, this is the place where you lived when this wounding experience happened. And then it's going to point towards what's coming up in the future, which is if you are dreaming about this, it probably means that you are ready to heal from it. Even if you don't consciously realize it, there is energy that's coming up from deep in the mind, in the subconscious part of the mind, and that energy can be used to help to heal. Now, I'll give you a quick example from a dream that I use this actually in my book. There was a man who came to Reddit who said that he had this dream that he was back in his family home. He's there with his sister. He hears on the radio that there is a big tornado coming. He looks outside and he sees the black clouds and they are rolling in real fast. He realizes that they need to get to the basement. He goes down to the basement and his sister is already there. She screams at the top of her lungs. We should have seen it coming. Mm. Now you might think that she's referring to the tornado and symbolically she is, but what she's really referring to is what I'll get to in just a moment. In the opening of the dream, we see the subject. It's about his family home. His parents aren't in the scene, but the storm coming is telling him something. That's the symbolic language that says something is coming and it might be very tumultuous in your life. It might upend things for you because why? Because you have something that you haven't dealt with. It's been 10 years since your parents divorced, but you haven't dealt with. He can feel this, but it's feelings that are way in the background. So he's not very conscious of them yet. 
When he goes down into the basement, what that means is down to where? Into your memories, especially the memories that you are keeping out of sight. Because what is a basement used for in many situations? It's to store things. So your dream starts with that idea and it creates an idea around it. And it uses the language of symbolism. It says, okay, well, it's in the basement because it's out of sight, out of mind. And what for you as the dreamer is out of sight, out of mind? The experience of your parents' divorce. You were a teenager at the time, and you just sort of went on with your life. You didn't deal with any of it. You just went on with your life, which is how many teenagers deal with traumatic situations like that. They're like, hey, don't bother me with this. I'm 15 now. I've got my friends. I don't want to, you know, <laughs> I don't want to have to deal with this. So the real clue to the dream that ties it all together, and I find this in most dreams, is that there is one thing that will stand out to me as very important. In this dream, it's the sister's statement. She says, why didn't we see it coming? What she's referring to is the parents' divorce. It was something that they saw the signs. You know, the dark clouds were gathering in their family relationship. The parents were having some trouble. But for the most part, they kept it from their kids. And then all of a sudden, the bomb drops. The tornado descends out of the sky. The parents say, hey, we're getting divorced. And the kids are like, huh? You know, like, oh, okay, I guess if we look back on it, we could have kind of seen the signs coming. But, you know, hey, this is still a big surprise to us. Now, it also speaks to a deeper level of what's going on with the dreamer because these memories are coming up at that time of his life for a reason. And it's because he needs to go back and deal with it. He needs to find the part of himself that is lost or split off from that experience. His sister is in the dream because she was part of that experience too. So this is the way that dreams take a situation. They show you what happened in the past. They show you what's going on in the present and then what could be happening in the future. And in this case, what could be happening for this guy is, is, is that he's going to go through a period that's going to be very emotionally turbulent for him. You know, the tornado is going to descend and it might upend his life a little bit, especially his internal life. But if he does that, there is sort of a promise that afterwards will be blue skies and sunshine waiting for him. In other words, he's going to heal the past and it's going to help him to better live in the present. Hmm. I, wow, I think that's a pretty great example of an interpretation template for a pretty specific situation. I think that makes a lot of sense. And let's get deeper into that symbolism interpretation in general. Maybe some popular examples, popular dreams people have for maximum relatability. What would you say are some of the most common scenes and symbols and dreams and what they might mean? Well, a very common theme that pops up is the dream about being in a car or driving a vehicle. And it often refers to the daily progress or course of your life and the amount of control that you have. Because when you are driving a car, you have your hands on the wheel and you have your feet on the pedals and you are able to control the speed and direction of the vehicle, which translated into dream language, it means the speed and direction of your life. Now, what does it say when you are a passenger in a vehicle and somebody else is driving? It can mean that you are not controlling the speed and direction of your life, or it could represent an area of your life. Like if it's your supervisor who's in the driver's seat of your car, well, now you know that your supervisor is controlling the speed and direction of your work life. It could be anyone. It could be a parent who's in the driver's seat. Teenagers dream about this a lot. They'll be in a car with their parent and the parent is driving because the parent is the one who's in control of their life, right? Or if they are the one who has to take over the wheel, what does that say about the parent's ability to lead? So that is one theme. Another one is being in your home and you are either just sort of going through what appears to be a kind of ordinary situation with your family or whoever you live with, or you are exploring your home. And this is a great chance for us to look at how dreams use the language of symbolism. What is a home? It is the place where you live. 
What is your mind? It's the place where your consciousness lives. What is your body? It's the place where your mind and consciousness live. So a home can represent that sort of metaphorical idea of the place where you live. Also, a home is something that is constructed. So a home can mean it can symbolize the ways that you are building up your life. Now, take an idea such as a very common dream theme is you are in your home. It may not look like the actual home that you live in, but you just know in the dream, this is, this is my home, and you find a new room or a new section to the home. Well, what does that mean? Take the previous ideas. Home is your life. It's the life you build or construct for yourself. Oh, well, hey, if you find a new room, then it can mean that you are finding out something new about yourself. This is you discovering, opening up some new area of your life or of your psyche, of your being. It can be a new area in your feelings. It can be a new area of knowledge. It can be an avenue for exploration, for something that you want to find out more about, about yourself in particular. So homes, driving in cars, and then we can get into things that are, say, more specific themes. Being in school. I mentioned this earlier just briefly. One of the great ways of interpreting a dream is start off by stepping back and simplifying the ideas that are presented in the dreams. Brainstorm ideas like other words that can be used in association with the characters and the settings, you know, like a police officer could mean authority, you know, a teacher could mean I'm learning something. A school has similar sorts of ideas, but we need to expand beyond the idea of just book learning. Dreams can address what you are learning academically. If you are in school, you are very likely to dream frequently about school and being in school in the subject's related to school. But if you were somebody who, say, hasn't touched a classroom in 20 years and you're dreaming about being in school all the time, you know it has nothing to do really with academic learning, unless, of course, that's going on in some way in your life. But what else are you learning? You're learning about yourself. You're learning about your life. You could be learning more about work. I find very often a theme in the dreams of people who have encountered something at work and they are unprepared for it. They will dream about being back in school and it's exam day and they haven't been there all semester. Or they find out that they have more classes to take in order to graduate. I have that theme quite often in my dreams. And I have been able to interpret and understand those dreams as I have encountered something in my waking life and I don't feel prepared for it. School is what prepares us for our work life, right? Well, now you have a dream that's showing you in school, and when you are unprepared for an exam, just simply look at it as, what is something important going on in my life for which I feel unprepared? Simplify it down to that. And then oftentimes you can make that connection and go, oh, yeah, hey, you know, well, I'm writing a book. I'm an author. This actually happened to me. And I am used to the journalism format of writing where I might pump out 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 words. And this is a 60,000 word manuscript. And man, is it a lot to wrap my mind around. There is a lot of information here. I'm not used to organizing all of this information and writing into a coherent structure where you start at page one and you end on page 240, and all of it flows together. There is a skill set for that that most people are not going to be prepared for when they're in school because they're not writing 240-page papers. I mean, unless you have a master's thesis or a PhD dissertation or something, you are not dealing with work that it's that long. So being in school, being in home, driving in your car, these are very common themes. I have one that has come up over and over again, and maybe because I'm a moderator at Reddit and it's more of a younger crowd that's very tuned into modern media, I get a lot of dreams about zombies. <laughs> I, what is it? You know, I mean, I've watched The Walking Dead and I dug it and everything, you know, but man, this theme pops up a lot. Now, if you step back from it and you really simplify what is a zombie, well, there's different ways of looking at it. 
And your dreams can use these different ways of looking at it to create symbolism, to tell stories about what's going on in your life, the events in your life, and also what's going on inside you in your thoughts and in your feelings. So you have the dream about a zombie and of course you have to look at it with other details of the story to really understand which use of the symbolism the dream is using all of the details of the dream tie together so if it is a zombie that's trying to eat your brains well that's one thing and could mean that you feel like there is something that is sapping all of the life or intelligence out of you. You know, maybe you've been watching too much mindless television <laughs> when it's like a zombie that's eating your brain. This is a simplistic example, but people really do have this imagery, this type of imagery pop up in their dreams. But a zombie could mean that you feel like you are surrounded by mindless people. The way that a zombie moves slowly and sluggishly, that can describe how you feel about what's going on in your life right now. You might feel lethargic, you know, you might feel slow, but now let's get a little deeper. A zombie is something that is transforming, but it got stuck between two stages. One is alive, one is dead, and then you have your zombie that is in between. It's not fully alive, it's not fully dead, right? Mm -hmm. We'll start with that idea. What could that describe about what's going on in your life? What kind of situations could it describe? Let's say that you broke up with someone, you had a relationship, you broke up with someone, and you are still holding out hope for that relationship. Well, the relationship is dead, but your hope for it is still alive. It's a zombie. Mm. Okay. So this is how dreams create symbolism. You know, I just talked about the X. I get a lot of dreams, people coming to Reddit and they want to know why they're dreaming about their X. You know, somebody that they used to love and maybe they still do love them, but they're not together as a couple anymore. Well, there are a lot of reasons for this, different potential reasons for it. And most likely it is either that A, you are learning from the experience so that you don't repeat the same mistakes, or B, you are recognizing something that's going on presently in your life that somehow reminds you of the past, or C, you have this thing going on where you, you are reminded of the past and you want the person and the qualities that they had or that time of life. And the dream uses it as a symbol to tell a story around. Just for example, you see your ex in the dream because that is somebody who, when you were in a relationship with that person, it brought out the best in you. You really wanted to be the best person you could be because you were motivated by the desire to preserve the relationship. Now, what's going on in your life? Are you still trying to be the best that you can be? If so, or even if not, that person can come up in the dream to represent that idea. And then the other details of the dream will form together around that idea to tell the story about what's going on presently in your life. It refers to the past. It talks about the present. And then it points towards the future. This is the standard structure of what most dreams do. So we can get into one other one real quick. And I know that your audience, having listened to your show, I know your audience is going to like this one. <laughs> Aliens and UFOs and alien abductions. Hell yeah. This theme seems to come up a lot. And the ones that I talked about first, the dreams about your home, dreams about your car, those are the most common themes. But then if you look at, call them the outer circle of themes that are still popular that arise a lot in people's dreams. You get a lot of dreams about aliens and alien-like subjects. And what I find is, is that a dream begins with the idea of alien and then simplify it. Now, if you think of an alien, what is another word for alien? An alien is foreign. How can you weave an idea or a story around that idea? Well, you might be dreaming about something that is foreign to you. It's outside the scope of your experience. You might be dreaming about a foreigner. Take some of the reports about aliens and 
people, how they interact with them. And now you can create other stories. You can address a subject such as the aliens are here to give us their cosmic wisdom and knowledge. Well, that could mean that you are looking for something knowledge wise, especially spiritual knowledge that is outside of the norm. Aliens abduct people from their homes. This is a common story. Well, how could that be used to relate to what's going on in your life? Well, maybe you have a fear of being separated from your family. Maybe that fear is just a general fear, or maybe you know that let's say you are going to take a job and it's going to take you to a new town. Well, that means you're going to be separated from your family. An alien and a UFO drops in out of the sky, out of nowhere, and it upends your life, kind of like the tornado that we referred to earlier. Well, how can that be used to describe what's going on in your life? Well, it could mean that there is something you fear or you think is suddenly going to change everything for you. This theme was very common back during the Cold War when we were constantly having this reminder that the Soviet Union could launch their ICBMs any moment. And what's going to happen? They're going to drop down from the sky and it's going to destroy everything. So people started having a lot of dreams about aliens in order to describe what was going on and in their lives, that fear that something was just going to drop down from the sky and suddenly change or destroy everything. Hmm. So pretty cool, huh? Some interesting dream symbolism. It goes on and on. And You know, I talk about this in very great depth in my dream dictionary. I really wanted to go into more depth than most dream dictionaries go into because there are so many possibilities presented by every dream symbol. And the subjects, the symbolism is often so personal and the subjects of the dreams are so personal that it is impossible for someone like me sitting at a computer typing words into a document and then giving it to a publisher and having them print it out and give it to you out there. You know, I can't guess at everything that is going on in your life, but I can teach you how to decode the language of your dreams for yourself. So I did it in a dream dictionary format because that's very accessible to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, it's definitely fascinating. And there is actually some debate over if all abduction experiences or alien experiences are dreams or if there might be a connection between the phenomenon and the sleep state. Possibly it's just designed to feel like a dream. But regardless, uh, you also shared with me an example that was pretty extreme. I guess we could refer to it as the fisting example. Uh, Can you tell us about that one? Yeah, I sure will. This is one that I've got to warn your audience. I know, you know, we're we're all adults here. We can handle this. This was a real dream, and I use it as an example in my book in the entry for fisting, as in anal fisting, okay? But it's under fisting, and it's a great example. So let's delve into it. So the dream opens, and the dreamer is observing in third person. He sees a man who it turns out looks a little bit like himself, but there's enough distance in the dream for him to just observe. And he sees the man be abducted off of the street by an alien who is in a human disguise. The alien takes the man through a storefront to the back of the store. And there he drops his pants and he reveals a fat, bald sphincter. All right. He compels the abductee to take his hand and put it inside of the sphincter and then his entire arm and then to, well, rock back and forth. So as the man is compelled to do this, the alien starts to glow blue and moan and he's approaching orgasm. The man keeps fisting the alien and the alien then, ex- like this blue light, the human disguise falls off of the alien, kind of melts away. And now the, it, it's full blown alien. The alien is moaning. He reaches orgasm. And then the man, the abductee, dies in horror in a flash of blue light. So this was a real dream. And I helped to interpret it at Reddit. And this is what we came up with. The man who had the dream is a playwright, and he has been commissioned to write a play 
for a man who is a foreigner. So now we have our first clue, foreigner, alien. Could there be a connection? Okay. The second part is the storefront. The storefront in the dream symbolizes the dreamer's public work life because a storefront is a public place that's related somehow to business and work. So the man's a playwright. He's been commissioned by a foreigner, an alien, to write a play. So what does it mean to be abducted? Well, in this case, it was that the playwright felt like he wouldn't have been associated with this foreigner and writing the play for this man unless he needed to earn a buck. So it's something that he wouldn't be doing otherwise. And his feelings about it are shown graphically in the scene where the abductee fists the alien. What that expresses is the man's feeling that his artistic creative side of himself feels like he is being compelled to do something obscene for somebody else's pleasure. When you step back from that scene and you simplify it, that is what it is saying. He's compelled to do something obscene for somebody else's pleasure. Now, it's very subjectively based. Someone else might say, hey, you got to earn a buck. And if this guy's willing to pay, then you just, you know, you dance to his tune. Well, he said, look, here's the thing. The guy doesn't understand our culture and he doesn't understand playwright culture. He has this idea of what he wants and it's very much outside of the norm. I keep coming to him with my best work and then he's rejecting it and making all these changes and he's forcing me to go back and kind of dance to his tune. This is why he feels abducted. Another layer of meaning to this is that he's forced to do this guy's bidding, this foreigner, this alien. So the die in horror as the man orgasms, it's just a very exaggerated as the alien orgasms, right? And the man who's abducted dies in horror. This is just a very exaggerated way of expressing the feelings of the man who is the playwright, who is forced to do the bidding of the foreigner. It's it's well, one is it's very memorable, but two is even though it's exaggerated, it actually expresses how he feels. I mean, he feels like at any moment he could kind of die in horror, you know, in the figurative, exaggerated sense that there's a side of him that is really just horrified by what he's having to do. And he's doing it in order to be able to just earn a buck. So that right there is a great example of a way that a dream can use this sort of very shocking, sometimes, you know, even obscene imagery to create a story around it. And it's very deeply meaningful. In fact, Sigmund Freud said that these type of dreams that are the most absurd and the most outrageous can often be the most revealing about the dreamer. These are the dreams that a Dr. Freud says, oh, yes, tell me about that dream because we can, <laughs> you know, we can talk about this one for hours. You know, there's a lot that we can learn from this. Another reason why people have alien abduction dreams, especially the ones that start off, there's a commonality to the descriptions. It starts off with, I was asleep, I woke up and the UFO was out my window, I was floating off the ground, or the little gray guys were gathered around my bed, and I look around and I see them and they take me away. This is how these abduction reports often begin. And whenever I hear a UFO abduction report that starts like that, I think in the back of my mind, I really wonder whether what you experienced was sleep paralysis. Mm -hmm. The medical term for it is called REM atonia. So REM is rapid eye movement and atonia means slackness of muscle. And what it happens is while you are dreaming, the signals traveling from your brain down to the body through the nervous system are muted. Some of it can leak through a little bit. Like if you dream about running, you might twitch a little bit in your legs or you dream about punching something and you might move your arms or something. When people actually do start really kicking their legs hard or punching hard and they're dreaming about it, it means that there is something that signal is no longer being muted and it's actually leaking through to the body and the body is responding to what it's seeing in the dream imagery. So what happens in sleep paralysis is you wake up 
and you are still dreaming. So what happens is usually your dreaming mind responds to what you are thinking and especially what you are feeling. Right. If you wake up in a state of sleep paralysis and you don't know what the heck is going on, a common reaction is that you will either go from fear to full-blown terror. If you go into a state of full-blown terror while you are dreaming and your eyes are open, so your eyes are open but you are still dreaming, your dreams will pull into the deepest, darkest, nastiest well inside of you that it can to pull imagery out of. Damn. For some people, their deepest, darkest fear is to be abducted by aliens. For other people, it might be related to demons or devils or witches or something like that. So when you are in sleep paralysis, your dreams respond to what you're feeling. And if what you feel is heavy fear, then your dreams will create imagery in response to it. And there is a study that suggests that many abduction experiences are actually resulting from sleep paralysis. Yeah, sleep paralysis is a weird one, man. I've always thought that was pretty fascinating. I know a few people who are pretty hardcore materialists who really don't have any interest in the paranormal or anything strange, and they've had some sleep paralysis experiences that you know, made them do a 180 on some of that stuff. And I also wanted to ask you, on the subject of major symbols that people see in dreams, let me ask you about animals, because we know animals as symbols is a common motif for a lot of cultures. Are there ones that appear most commonly in dreams or animals whose symbols are less ambiguous than others? Well, there are, you know, the animals that appear most often, in my experience, are the animals that are closest to us. So it's probably going to be our pets or something that is presented as a pet, and it's going to be that type of animal. So you're talking about dogs, cats, birds, and maybe fish and lizards. But let's just stick to dogs and cats right now. You know, dreams begin with the things that we associate with the imagery in the dream, the symbol in the dream. It begins there. And then it works based off, it creates symbolism around our associations. So what that means is when you think of a dog, you are going to have certain thoughts that come to mind right away. It could be how you feel about dogs right now. It could be how you feel about dogs in general. It could be how you feel about a specific dog. Like if you are a dog lover and your you know, beautiful golden retriever is sitting there next to you, you might bring up words in association with dogs that are how you feel about your retriever. You know, loyal friend, companion. For other people, it might be guardian. But if you were kept up all night by your neighbor's barking dog, then you might describe a dog as a nuisance or as, you know, I want to kill the damn thing. So your dreams will begin with your associations and then it will build stories around it. And you can see those associations at work in how the dog is presented in the story, how it looks and how it acts. I find that probably the most common association for dogs and dreams is with friendship. The dog will represent the subject of friendship or a specific friend. I'll give you a quick example. There was a guy who came to the Reddit forum and he was very disturbed by a dream that he had. He said that there was this dog that was being all friendly and following him around. And he decided that he didn't want the dog around anymore. So he tells the dog to go away and the dog is like, oh, you know, you know, it's like not getting the hint. So he says he pulls out a gun and he shoots the dog. And the dog then still doesn't get the hint. The dog doesn't die. It's still kind of following him around. So he pulls out some bigger weaponry and fires that at the dog and keeps going. And the dog is just sort of unfazed by all of this. So he comes to the forum and he says, man, am I some kind of, you know, is there some deep, dark side of me lurking behind the scenes that I don't know about? you know, I'm this cruel animal killer or whatever. And I said, okay, well, first of all, you need to understand that the dream imagery is symbolic. It's figurative. It's telling a story. Don't take the imagery literally, no matter how shocking the imagery is. It's not making a moral statement about you. 
there are a few exceptions to that rule where dreams kind of create scenarios like the holodeck in Star Trek, and they can help you to realize what you really think and feel. But most dreams, you've got to strip out that literal interpretation of the imagery, and you have to look at it as symbolism, as figurative. In this case, what we traced it back to is the guy has somebody who you might call a friend who is sort of this hanger on and he has gotten tired of her and he decided that he was going to start dropping hints that says bug out. So he did that and the girl, the friend, supposed friend did not get the hint. So he started getting a little meaner and a little nastier and she just, it was just going right over her head. She wasn't getting it. So in the action of him, shooting the dog and then pulling out heavier and heavier weapons to shoot the dog and the dog does not die and just keeps following him around all friendly like is really describing the situation with the person that he's trying to get rid of. So that's how you take an imagery like that and you break it down with animals. You can often, we talked about associations, but you can also think about the qualities of the animal, the ways that they are used in stories, even in cartoons and stuff like that, because animals are often shown as being human-like, you know, in stories like, say, you know, The Lion King or the movie Ants. Now we've taken this creature and we've given it a life. And if you are taking in that kind of media, or you also see it a lot in like commercials and stuff. Well, now you have a really wide set or base of associations and ideas that could be used to talk about human stories, but using animals to symbolize it. Like, take the fact that birds fly. Well, what could flying represent? Well, how about freedom? How about the fact that birds were used as messengers? I mean, there, there are no more carrier pigeons that we know about, but birds were used as messengers so they can be messages from the subconscious side of the mind it can be something that says hey are you getting the message and if you aren't maybe the bird then attacks you and what it really represents is is that there is something inside of you that is saying hey hey give me your attention here hey you're 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 trying to ignore me and the more you ignore me the more i am going to get insistent that you pay attention to me So that's what a bird, especially a black crow, man, I find that a lot, you know, the, the black crow dream and it's makes you feel really creepy. And it's because the crow represents a message from the dark side of your mind, dark meaning outside of your conscious awareness. So yeah, animals are one that I would include Greg with that list that we were making of common dream symbols because they really do come up a lot. And I think it's because there is this great variety, A, of animals and B, the associations that we have with those animals that can be used to create symbolism and tell stories. Absolutely, man. And there's definitely a ton of very potent symbols When it comes to animals, bears, owls, snakes, there's just a ton of them. And well, right on. This has been a fun time for sure. I think dreaming and sleep in general are things we kind of take for granted. And dreams are often such personal experiences. You can never really do them justice when you try to tell other people. And a lot of times we're just stuck with this weirdness to deal with alone. So hopefully this was interesting and maybe even therapeutic for some people. And Last but not least, before we go, tell the people where they can follow up with you or dig deeper into your work, since we know this wasn't going to be enough. Well, of course, you know, I have the Dream Interpretation Dictionary, Symbol, Signs, and Meanings. It's on the market right now. It's at places like, you know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, Books A Million, Indiegogo. I want to make sure I mention the small ones because they're just as important for your business too. And it's there. It's in bookstores also. It is, it's 480 pages, man. And I poured everything I know into that book. I give you a guide in the back of it. It's called 
figuring out your dreams. And it's about 30 pages that explains my dreams one, two, three system of dream work, of interpreting dreams. You basically go through the story, you make associations, you tie the details together, you apply, you look for storytelling devices such as metaphors, puns, analogies. You, you, you can do these different techniques. Once you have them down, man, you can do it in five minutes. I kid you not. Now, it might take you a few hours the first time to really read through and digest everything. But once you have that base of knowledge, you can get in and then start to use the dictionary. You wake up from a dream and it was a zombie. It was an alien. It was your ex. You know, you dream you're getting married. You're driving in your car. You're building a home. You know, you're in school. You're standing there naked. You're flying. You're falling. You know, you're being chased. Whatever it is that there are symbolic possibilities for all of these things. And I go into real depth and detail about this. I don't just give the standard, you know, one, two, three sentence or two or three paragraphs. Even I can really go into depth and I approach most of the symbols almost like writing little essays. I want to teach you how to figure out this for yourself. The thing that annoys the crap out of me about dream dictionaries is they will just give you the definition, but they don't tell you how they reached that conclusion. You know, like, oh, I had a dream that I had crazy frizzy hair, you know, and you look it up in the dream dictionary and it says your thoughts are disordered and you go, oh, OK, well, why? Well, because hair grows from your head and your thoughts grow from your head. And now you look at crazy frizzy, you know, and hair grows out. It's an extension of something like thoughts are extensions out of the head, you know, and you go, OK, well, that makes sense. Most dream dictionaries don't explain how they reach their conclusions. They just give you the information. So I wanted to always at every point where I could explain how do I reach these conclusions? How do I teach you to do it for yourself? How do I teach you to look at your dreams as stories told through symbolism that are helping you to learn and grow, that there is meaning and significance, that the symbolism is a language and there's a way of following the patterns to that language? How do I do this? Well, I give you a guide to figuring out your dreams, and then I give you a dictionary with more than 750 entries in it that repeats the things that I say but it was specifically to the dream symbol. So it's reminding you of what I have taught you in the beginning. So now you can use the dream interpretation dictionary as your lifelong guide. You keep it there by your bedside. You wake up from a dream, you write it down and then you dig in and you go, okay, well, there was an interesting metaphor in this dream. Let's see what this guy has to say about metaphors. You know, I remember a symbol from the dream. Okay. Yeah. Let's look up that symbol, you know? And so now you start to put all the pieces together. That is the best place to go. And also dreams123.net. I have a lot of comments on some of the dreams, such as I talk about snakes and pregnancy dreams and death dreams. And people are picking up these results, people around the world, man. I watch the search engine results and it's crazy. I got people everywhere who are picking up the results off of my website and they're coming there or they're hearing about me on programs like yours and they're deciding they're going to dig deep and I'll see them, you know, digged into 10 or 15 or more articles on my website and they'll spend hours there just reading through all of this. I do have one other thing I want to suggest for your listeners. Look up We Love Dreams newsletter as one search phrase. I know at Google it will come up as the first result, and in most other search engines it will also. I haven't tried them all. The point is you look up We Love Dreams newsletter by J.M. DeBoard or Radal at Reddit. That's how I kind of promote myself. The newsletter started off as a Reddit dreams forum newsletter for pointing out really interesting dreams that we've had submitted there and interesting discussions. And over time, it's evolved into sort of my personal platform for communicating to people who want to stay in touch with me. And then I created an online dream interpretation correspondence course 
Basically, at my site is everything that you need to know to start off with dream interpretation, including remembering dreams and decoding dream symbolism, and then looking at all these different aspects, like how do I make associations and what does it mean when I have strong emotions and dreams and stuff like that. And so I take it all and I give it to you as emails that will automatically be sent to you. You give me your email address and your first name, last name if you want to, it's not necessary, and then you punch it in and you immediately start getting these emails sent to you and it, mm. it will give you everything that you need to know to at least get started and if you like me the way that I present this information I'm pretty loose about this man I'm the radical owl you know so I'm not going to be sitting there hitting you over top of the head with a bunch of big words and stuff you know I mean a few here and there but the point is is, is that I want to explain this in ways that's very accessible and understandable for people you don't need to have a PhD in psychology psychiatry to understand your dreams you know what you need really is here it is to understand that what you are doing is remembering what you already know when you interpret your dream you are reminding yourself of what you already know because you invented the dream when you start there you go oh okay well the dream's a story and i invented it to send a message from one side of my brain to the other hmm well how do I remind myself of what I already know? Then everything else about dream interpretation launches from there. Hmm. Awesome. There it is. And no doubt, dreams are definitely a curious thing, and it is a rabbit hole worth traveling town once in a while. So definitely thanks for this. J.M. DeBoard, a.k.a. Rad Owl, a.k.a. Mr. Sandman himself. Thanks again, and dream on. Right on, brother. Thank you for introducing me to your audience and having me on your show. I really appreciate it, Greg. You got it, man. Thanks for being here. Hallelujah and hello, people. J.M. DeBoard, Dream Interpretation, Symbolism, and the Subconscious. I think this was a pretty fun show, and it is great to be back talking to you people again. July 2017, gotta say, probably the best month of my life. Having all my friends out from home at the same time was amazing. Anyone who's ever relocated knows how it would feel to have, like, two dozen of your closest friends come out at the same time. So great. And the wedding was on point and a ton of fun. Having Gordon White in town was a blast. We actually broke him into his first game of beer pong, believe it or not. And I was definitely the one that brought down our team. I also have a friend, Mark, who can be a bit of a bullshitter, but he's also a level two sommelier, you know, a wine guy back home. And to hear him and Gordon wasted talking about wines from around the world was just hilarious for me. And Gordon thought it was hilarious that Mark does have all this knowledge of the world's wines, but has zero desire to travel. And he's just a character. And it was a lot of fun all around. The honeymoon in Tulum was excellent. Mayan ruins right on the beach. Huge iguanas crawling all over the place. We snorkeled in the cenotes, which are like caves of water. We got into one with hundreds of bats and, of course, a nice oil slick of bat shit on the surface of the water that I couldn't get past to fully enjoy myself. We snorkeled out in the reef in the ocean and saw these huge sea turtles like inches from us, and we saw a big manta ray. It was pretty incredible. I didn't get to swim with dolphins because apparently they were out of season near the reef, and I guess the only option was some semi-tame or enclosed dolphin place, and I didn't want to do it like that. But I could not have asked for a better break, a better time, or a better wife. And I recorded this show actually before I left, but there just wasn't enough time to get it edited beforehand. So I'm getting it out now. And I also did some fixing on the broken feeds, so make sure you refresh them and they should update. And I'm still in the process of moving apartments too. We didn't think we were busy enough in July, I guess, so we also decided to move across town or back to Pacific Beach because I could not stand being under the airport flight path. Every once in a while in THC episodes, you can hear a plane flying over and it's just annoying and it's finally gone. But I've got two more days to finish moving and two more days to hit you with at least one more show for July. And I will tell you, I recorded it also before I left and it's exciting. It's the return of a pretty popular guest, Tracy Twyman, 
So we have a pretty nice, calm, light one today about dreams and a deep, dark one with Tracy about the stuff of nightmares coming up soon. But hopefully you like this episode. I got my man's dream interpretation dictionary from the publisher and it was so thick and I just thought, hell yeah, dreams and their meanings would be a great topic. Not talked about nearly enough. And I hope you found something interesting in it. It is very odd how, as diverse as dreams can be, we still have these reoccurring threads and narratives that play through a lot of our heads. The teeth falling out stuff, the being naked in front of a crowd stuff, the being in school again, or not being able to graduate or not having the credits or whatever. A lot of people have those kind of things going on in their dreams. I actually learned, and I can't put them on blast, but two friends that were hanging out the wedding week actually started talking about abduction dreams that they have, recurring ones. And it was just really interesting to see these two people from totally separate areas of my life and one's describing, oh, I have these shadow figures and they're at the edge of my bed and then I have to look over at them and right when I look at them, that's when they rush me. And the other dude's like, yep, yep, absolutely. And then does this happen? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then does that happen? And I was like, holy shit. I've known these guys for a while. Didn't necessarily know that they were having these kind of dreams, but one of them does listen to THC, and he's one of the few friends of mine from high school that actually does, so maybe there's a connection there. He's he's down with the weirdness, for sure. But I've now recently learned three people close to me have routine abduction dreams, and that's just crazy. You, you think you know a guy, right? <laughs> you just never ask. I have another friend who I also can't put on blast who won't go see alien movies and i didn't really understand why and then i found out he had an experience that he don't even want to talk about but he also won't go see any alien themed movies because of that so pretty all-encompassing episode in terms of dreams if you think there's something we didn't get to in the first hour we probably covered it in the second we talked about dreams and dmt shared dreams even at different times Cases of prophetic dreams and picking winning lottery tickets in the dream state, getting insight into past lives in your dreams, falling in love in dreams with people that we never met in waking life, but always remember, I've had that experience, and also cases where we do actually meet the people that we fell in love with in dreams, how to increase dream retention, you know, all great stuff. So I think it was a solid return. Really actually loved the Magnora 7 episode that was right before I left about the Rothschilds carving up Africa. That was full of interesting stuff. And we got Tracy coming up next. So we are back in the saddle, guys, and riding on through to the promised land. And I'll see you soon. Your move, Jungian archetypes, subconscious characters, and lucid dreamers. Your fucking move. Lucid dreams are so vivid Cause you go to bed at seven And your brain comes alive Cause you hate your nine to five You wake up with a dread And make sure your cats are fed Did your brain talk to a ghost Who moved your coffee and your toast As you listen to the higher side chats You get to your desk And your boss says it's a mess And your soul slowly grows To a place where nothing grows When you think he's not around You insert a steady sound The OM says turn it down And you say it's just the higher side chats Oh, do you think you'll be invited To Bohemia Grove To a Bilderberg Club Oh, do you think you'll be invited Buy a Rothschild to a party on a submarine Diving down To the center of the earth Through the Marianas Trench Your teeth begin to clench From the sulfurous stench The mask you're given doesn't fit Cause you're not one of them Starting today, you'll make plans to get away There's no one to hold you down And the what-ifs start to drown Then you wake to the glare of a cold fluorescent stare And the light winks at you Cause its life is almost through But it's holding on to quit time just like you It's time for the high side chats Mm -hmm.